So, so the, the first thing is, uh, and I think you're absolutely right, we have no sense of how much energy has helped us escape poverty. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, um, Matt Ridley uh, wrote in his sort of Rational Optimist, uh, why was it fun to be Louis XIV? And I'm not quite sure whether it was fun, but I can certainly see if, if I were back then, I'd probably want to be him rather than anyone else. And, and one of the points, of course, was that he had lots and lots of servants doing everything for him. You know, he had a, a whole bunch of people uh, uh, cooking his meals and cleaning his palaces and you know, doing his gardens and all that stuff. The point of that is it's really fun if you're a Louis XIV, but it really sucks if you're any of the other guys who have to be the servant of Louis XIV. What energy has enabled us to do is to make a society where we can all be the kings and the machines are the servants. So, you know, if you put it in power, uh, the average uh, OCD person in the OCD, so in the rich world, has power that is equivalent to about a hundred slaves or a hundred servants. We have the power of a hundred human beings 24 seven. That's what takes us on rides. That's what washes our dishes. Or, you know, if you have a Roomba or whatever that uh, cleans up your house and do all these other amazing things, uh, you know, clean your, uh, your clothes. Uh, we have no sense of how much time, especially women used around the turn of last century. So around 1900, uh, it, was, it was more than a day and probably two days just spent washing. Now we do it with a machine. We do it with lots of power. So we have to realize that the reason why the world has become so great is because we have an enormous, an abundance of power. And that enables us to all be kings rather than you know, the one being a king and everybody else being servants. But of course, the problem is that that also leads to other issues like air pollution and global warming. And I think it's important to recognize both of these because we often jump to global warming and say, oh, see, this is a terrible issue. But what was a much more terrible issue coming from the Industrial Revolution was air pollution. Air pollution probably uh, 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 had an impact, possibly killing 20% of everyone that died in London around uh, 1890. It was a terribly polluted place. Everybody wrote about it. You know, huge on, on uh, industrial revolution, but also huge on air pollution. And we still see that in the, uh, what was in 1953, I think, when, when they had the big uh, 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 soups and, you know, uh, Churchill was faced with the fact that uh, there was this crisis where, what, 6,000 people died in, in, uh, in, uh, in London in just a few weeks because of terrible coal air pollution. But we fixed that. How do we fix that? Through technology. So the simple answer is not to say, let's do without the power. It was to make better power. Now we did that partly through scrubbers on our smokestacks. We also did that by switching from coal to gas. We eventually also switched, uh, or at least some nations did, to nuclear, which pollutes even less. The idea here is to recognize that while there were problems, anyone in a heartbeat would have said, I'd rather have the Industrial Revolution and cough than just being dirt poor. But the best outcome, of course, is have the Industrial Revolution cough, be smart, figure out a solution, and then just be rich. And that was what we did. We're now standing at the same sort of issue where we're realizing there is another pollutant that comes out of burning fossil fuels, not just the thick smoke that was obvious, but also carbon dioxide, CO2, which leads to a warm up of the planet. That's absolutely incontrovertible. So let's just get that on the, on, on the table. But the question is, how big of a problem is it? And what can we do about it? And that's where I think the, the, the conversation that we have right now has sort of gone off the tracks. Uh, you know, people will tell you this is the end of the world. If you read the UN climate panel reports, it is not. The UN tells us this is a problem. It's by no means the end of the world. A problem that we then have to weigh up against the cost of actually doing something about it. And the answer, like pretty much anything that we do in human society is you do some of it, you fix some of it until the damage costs are lower than the additional cost if you try to fix more of it. 
Well, this is a really interesting area to explore right at this point in time because Australia's just had a very long hot summer and what appear to be extraordinarily bad bushfires, which have made us a global poster boy, it seems. We're being castigated everywhere for being failures on climate change. I have to say I'm gravely concerned about the nature of the public debate because it seems so driven by passion and emotion that this whole thing we've been trying to say about the need for calm, quiet reason in the face of problems has given way to, a, even amongst well-educated people, to a, the skies are falling in, it's all the government's fault, and it ignores one absolutely incontrovertible issue for Australians. We should certainly be good global citizens. We can do everything we like on the technological front, etc., etc., etc. We can try and formulate good policies, but nothing that could have been done by an Australian government in the past, today or tomorrow, is going to have any impact of any sub substantial basis at all on Australia's seasons. It's not going to happen. So in the discussion about abatement and adjustment, the reality for Australia is no matter what we try to do with abatement, we're still going to have to adjust. If we're not careful, we will make decisions that do almost nothing for abatement, but make it nearly impossible for us to adjust. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's helpful maybe to talk about something else in the bushfires because they've become so inflamed, sorry, uh, but but let's just uh, let's let's think about something else because th this happens constantly in the climate conversation. Uh, if you think about the U.S. Uh, and how uh, you know every time there's a hurricane, certainly Al Gore uh, used a hurricane that came out of a smokestack in his in his movie uh, as a way of saying global warming leads to hurricanes and that's terrible. And yes, absolutely, hurricanes are terrible. Uh, but remember, uh, there was actually a period from 2006. Uh, and seven years out, where the U.S. had no strong hurricanes. No strong hurricanes hit the U.S. It never happened in the history, uh, of, of the recorded history of the U.S. Uh, nobody mentioned that. It was not like people were saying, hmm, that's odd. This doesn't fit the global warming narrative. Maybe we should come out and say maybe it's not as bad. That would have been bad and wrong to say that. But what happened when Hurricane Sandy, which was just barely a Hurricane 1, hit a very populated place was, uh, you might have seen uh, Bloomberg Newsweek uh, 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 cover where it said, it's global warming, stupid. You know, so the point is, whenever something bad happens, global warming. And whenever bad things don't happen, we just ignore it and we talk about something else. That is not the right way to have a conversation about global warming. So I think that's where we need to realize we're not being helped by a conversation that constantly scan the planet and say, what's the worst thing that's happened? And let's blame that on global warming. That's probably not the right way we're gonna fix this. This is the only way we're gonna make sure we inflame everyone, we get everyone very emo uh, emotional, and we're likely, as you point out, to spend enormous resources on doing almost nothing. So when we get back then to the bushfire. So fundamentally, I think we need to get a, a, a couple of facts on, 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 on the discussion first. Uh, bushfires have declined dramatically in Australia over the last 120 years. We know that because we have good statistics from about 1900. Uh, back then, about 11% of Australia's area burnt each year. Today, we know that with uh, satellites, it's about 5% that burns. All of that period, it's declined from 11% down to about 5.3% today. If you look at the current season, if you use the numbers that Guardian has, uh, has produced, which actually indicates that almost 20 million uh, hectares has burnt uh, across Australia, uh, and if you assume that some of it is not, uh, as, so you also assume that there's extra that has been burnt as a, as a, as a prescribed burning. And then of course also recognize that the whole uh, fire season is not over. If you say, all right, what is the ratio of the current fire season to the whole fire season in the satellite history? Then you get that the full fire season will probably have burnt a little less than 4%. So in the very, very low end of what you normally see. 
Now, this is not to say that the fires were not exceptional in any regard in Victoria and New South Wales. And that obviously matters because that's where a lot of people live. Now, it's also where a lot of cameras live and that's where you, why you have this, that it's, you know, it's great TV by any standards, but it's not great to inform you because what we know is that the climate models tell us as climate change gets worse, we will see more bushfires. But the important part is they tell us we'll see more bushfires in all areas of vegetation except for tropical savanna. So maybe you should take out Northern Territory, and even if you do, you get the same result as what I, I just told you here. So what we're basically seeing is we're having people say, oh, in Victoria and New South Wales, much more bushfire, global warming. But they're ignoring the fact that we actually saw less bushfire in all the other areas, although if this was really global warming, it should have been more. Now, that's one part of the conversation. But the other part, and I think the more interesting one, is to say, so what can you do about it? And there, as you also rightly pointed out, there seems to be this misconception that if we just put up a solar panel, it'll stop burn. And that, you know, if, when you just say it, you can sort of hear that, yeah, that, that doesn't sound right. But actually, we also can run it in the models. So if you look at the models for, for Australia, we estimate, as I said, 5.3% is burning right now. By the end of the century, because of global warming, if we don't do anything, uh, we'll probably have about 6% burnt every year. That's 0 0.7 percentage points more every year. That's definitely a problem. That's something we should talk about. How do we avoid that? But if Australia went totally carbon neutral for the rest of the century, remember this would have an enormous cost, and we can talk about the cost in just a second. It's almost unfathomable that it would be possible. But let's just assume that Australia stopped, as the first nation in the world, stopped entirely emitting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and did so for the rest of the centuries, 2021, 2022, and there's a lot of years all the way up to 2100. If you manage that amazing feat, instead of seeing 6% burn by the end of the century, you would see 5.997% burn. So as you rightly pointed out, even in 80 years time, you would not be able to tell the difference from this fantastically costly policy. So there's something fundamentally wrong about the way that we say, all right, here's a problem. Let's fix it by cutting carbon emissions. If we, when we look at the models, actually realize the only thing the model tells us, if you cut a lot at really, really high cost, you'll have almost no impact in 100 years. That is a very bad way to help people. Now, there's a lot of smart ways to help people, and, and a lot of people have been talking about this, prescribed burns, you know, better building uh, 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 codes, uh, that you have uh, fire tunnels, that you have much more uh, surveillance, that there's a lot of other ways that you can actually do this and can do so smartly. And this is true in a lot of different circumstances. Now, again, this does not mean we should do nothing about global warming, because remember, the only benefit from doing global warming policies is not just that it burns less in Australia. There's a lot of other benefits and we should include all of those and I'm sure we'll talk about it in just a second. But when it comes down to saying, my God, look at this, these burns, let's cut a ton of CO2, it's just simply an non sequitur. It's actually almost immoral, I would say, to say we're gonna do the costliest but least effective thing to help the future victims of bushfires the least. Somehow that doesn't seem to me like compassion. It almost seems like the opposite. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.